Hotel Bar Karaoke. This story takes place three months ago at a karaoke bar. My boyfriend's older sister, Angie, and I went out for the first time together and went onto like this bar that hosts a karaoke night every Friday night. She had a guy friend, Paul, who met us there, who had a crush on her, and he bought us drinks the whole night. We were having a good time. It was like 2 a.m. and we were sitting outside because both Paul and Angie smoke, but I don't. But because I didn't want to stay in there alone or anything, I went with her. We found a wooden table with bench-like seats. The two of them sat down on one side of the table, and I was on the other side by myself talking with them. Some random guy, Pete, was behind me, standing like three feet away, leaning on the wall. But like he was close enough that I could see him if I moved my eyes to the left a bit. And she is very outgoing. And so as we're talking, she ended up asking him some questions. I can't remember what she asked because I wasn't paying attention to them, but rather to the people who were talking around us. But he ended up responding and slowly was approaching my side of the table. Once he got to my side, he sat down beside me, at which I already started to get a weird vibe from him. I was talking to Angie about something and when I stopped, Pete started asking where I was from since it was clear I was not from England since I have no British accent. I told him I'm from Canada and he told me he works for immigration at the airport, to which I said, oh nice, not showing much interest. He asked what I could possibly be doing here and I replied by telling him that I was visiting my boyfriend. Angie was even talking about how she was here with her brother's girlfriend, me, to other people she was having conversations with. Pete had both of his arms resting on the table, one of his hands holding his glass of whatever he was drinking that night, and then he moved the hand that was closest to me and put it on his lap. But being that I'm a very observant person, I noticed this, and was starting to already feel uncomfortable. As Angie and Paul were talking about stuff with the other people who were outside, because my hand was resting on my lap, he moved over to the bench to be closer to me and reached for my hand and held it really firm and hard. I quickly pulled it away and moved myself over a bit on the wooden bench and put my hand that he had just held on the table and held my drink. He put it back in his lap and within a few minutes later, he was reaching under the table again, but this time, he grabbed my knee and held it. I pushed his hand away again and repeated, I have a boyfriend to him. And even Angie was like, dude, she has a boyfriend in case you didn't hear for the first three times we said it. So we carry on outside for the next hour, and when it gets to 3 a.m., when the bar closes, Angie and I were going to go back home, but she decided she wanted to hang out at Paul's place for a bit and drink a bit more there and shit, so I agreed. But all of a sudden, Pete asks, Oh, well, can I come with you? I'm only here for tonight, and I go back to where I live tomorrow. And Angie said, I mean, it's not my house, but if my friend is fine with it, sure. So Paul allowed him to come along to his place with us. Angie called an Uber to get us to Paul's house. While we waited at the table for the Uber, Pete said, We can go back to my motel room and wait for an Uber. I'm staying right there. The bar was part of the hotel. So Angie was of course agreed, but I didn't like that idea so much because he kept saying how pretty we looked, etc. The entire time we were going to this hotel, and plus, I I didn't know how to get home myself since I had no, even no idea where I was, so I just followed them, I guess. We get in the room, and we wait 10 minutes for the Uber. The whole time, Pete is full on staring at us, smirking, and shit for God knows whatever the reason is. We got to our friend's house. Pete is flirting with me and even rubbed my leg again when I was sitting on the floor because I wasn't feeling too good. Skip to when we all leave. Pete tells us he was going to book an Uber for himself, so naturally Angie and I booked a separate Uber to get home, but I ended up glancing down at his phone when he was booking the Uber and he never actually booked a ride. He was just chilling on the app, acting like he was. I thought this was weird. So 15 minutes later out, our Uber is outside. It's like 5 a.m. now. Pete was like, hey, can I just hop in there with you two? And Angie replied kind of hesitantly like, uh, okay, but I thought your Uber was on its way though. He was like, I don't know, but it had the weirdest tone in his voice. So he has a smoke outside the car before getting in. Her and I are in the car with the driver. And that's when I tell her that he never actually booked a ride for himself. We both looked at one another for a few seconds in confusion. And you could tell that now she was seeming a bit more cautious with what she was doing or saying with him. So the plan was the Uber was going to drop us two first and then take him to wherever he needed to go. So because of this, she asked the driver to take us to the road before the one with our house on it because she didn't want him to know where we lived because now she feels like she didn't trust him. He finally gets into the car. I'm on the right side. She's in the middle and he gets in on the left. The whole time I could hear him trying to flirt with her and saying shit like want to hook up. And then at one point he was like, she can join in too. And she kept saying no a bunch of times to him. I was looking out the window because I didn't want to look at him at all. But when he said that, I gave him a weird look. But I don't think he really paid any attention to it. I looked back out my window. 
This is when it got a lot more weird and creepy. He kept saying he was coming home with us and not going back to wherever he was going. He was not letting up on coming with us. Angie told him we were walking home after a certain point because she didn't have the money to pay the whole ride. And he was like, that's okay. I'll just follow you home. We can have a good time. So finally, after like 10 minutes of this, she was like, can you pull over to a driver? And he was very confused by this probably because he never got asked this and said, uh, and she was like, please pull over now. And so he did. Pete started to wonder why she was doing this and asked, what are you doing, babe? And she was like, I told you, you aren't coming with us back home. Get out. At this time, I was looking at him directly. She was getting angry because he wasn't getting out of the car. So she started raising her voice and was like, we aren't moving until you get the fuck out of this car and call yourself a different Uber. Pete started to get kind of serious now and like, why? What did I do? I'm sorry, etc. And then she just replied, leave. To that, he told her that he was only leaving. If she gave him her number, she refused. Then he told us he wasn't leaving the car until she did so. She said, fine. Took his phone, put in some random number she thought of, and then gave it back to him. He was still trying to convince her to let him stay with us, but she wasn't having it and told him goodbye. He got out of the car finally, and she slammed his door shut and told the Uber to get away from there and take us home. I was worried next time I went to that bar that Pete would be there, but I haven't seen him since this situation. I, I always wonder what would have happened if Angie wasn't as outgoing as she was and kicked him out of the car. I think we would have been in some serious trouble. Drunk weirdo tried to scout us at a karaoke place. About two weeks ago, a friend and I decided to go for a karaoke session in town. It was about 11pm at night, and we booked a room for a minimum of three hours. Upon entering the room, a few young men huddled outside the room and stared in, being really petite young women. My friend D immediately freaked out thinking they were dangerous. The waitress taking our order told us that they were regulars, and we shouldn't worry then that the guy was probably tipsy. One of the men, older than the rest, came in and started chatting both of us up, asked if we sang and if you could join us. The conversation went a little like this. Hi girl, so do you sing? Can I join you? Sing a song for me. I want to do a duet. Do you sing Korean songs? Uh, but don't you have a room of your own? Yeah, yeah, but I want to sing with you. Pick a song now, don't worry about me. I'm just an asshole, I know I'm an asshole. The waitress who was taking our order frowned at him and jokingly asked him to leave us alone. He left and we started singing and began to forget about him. A while later, we saw him loitering outside our room again. I thought he was just on his way to the smoking room, which was just down the hall from us, but he popped his head in, again demanding that we sang for him and with him. I told him no, that we didn't know him and we were not comfortable with it, and he started telling us that he was an asshole, and he knew it. His friends came out of their room and dragged him away. About 45 minutes later, he popped his head in again, just staring at us. We looked at him warily, D clutching onto my arm the entire time. He pushed the door open and stood in front of it, telling us that we should really sing for him. At this point, I got pretty annoyed and told him that he was disrupting our date. Conversation went like this. Yeah, I know, and I don't want to disturb your date, but I want you to sing. So sing. But we don't want to. We really don't feel comfortable singing in front of strangers. Okay, okay. I know I'm an asshole. I'm just an asshole and I know it. I'm an asshole. I'm scouting here. I want to hear you sing. I'm looking for singers here and I want you to sing with me. D lost it before I did and raised her voice. Okay, we're trying to enjoy ourselves here so can you please? He nodded his head and did this weird bow at us as if to apologize and stumbled out. We spent the next hour and a half nervous that we pissed him off that he would come back and make us pay. We finally eased up and started to enjoy ourselves and kept seeing him loitering outside our room. His friends would laugh and push him out of the way. When we finally left, D and I were taking a couple of selfies outside and their entire group came out as well. We walked to the main road to hail a cab, but got distracted with a dub smash app and began to actually have fun again. We looked back and there they were, walking towards us. Asshole guy looked pretty smug and was staring at us all the way since we were in a public space with people walking around and studying in the Starbucks just next to us. We were feeling pretty brave if their group found a couple of benches and stared at us the entire 45 minutes that we were talking and messing around with Dub Smash. Eventually, we took a cab and went our separate ways. While driving past them, though, I saw that the asshole guy was staring into my cab right at me. I can't put my finger on what he looked like. His eyes conveyed anger, 
but he was smiling, a really stiff, creepy smile. I looked away and clutched my keys the entire walk up to my apartment. So creepy asshole man, let's not meet ever again. The man with a thick accent. Before I get into the story, there's a few things you need to know. First, I'm an artist, and I've always been very in my own world, as it were, if I'm thinking of a story or a character or a picture I wanted to draw. I'd walk into walls and forget anything anywhere and place items in weird places while I was thinking. To give you an idea of the extent of this, my first place to look for anything I've lost is the fridge and freezer. I found remotes, my cell phone, art equipment, anything else in there. Second, I've always had a very negative view when it comes to alcohol or any narcotics. I don't mean to shame any one of you reading this with it, but it was always something I just generally regarded as pointless. However, if you find enjoyment in it, all the better to you. Third, I am a very asexual person. I never desire sex or have any interest in finding a mate, so flirting usually flies over my head. And finally, due to my childhood, I have a mild case of anxiety disorder, which has lately been worse due to this event and escalated by other ones. This particular story begins when I graduate from an upper secondary school for visual arts. I had decent enough grades, my best being biology and English and of course, art. I immediately looked for work after graduation since I had graduated a year and a half late because of some health issues and the entrance exams for universities were already done by the time I graduated so I had one and a half years before even the possibility to apply for a university. I would send hundreds of applications to any place that would take me, honestly, and hardly ever get even invited for an interview. This took its toll on me and I got depressed. I'd hardly leave the house, and I stopped taking care of myself altogether. I wouldn't shower, put on makeup, brush my teeth, anything. I'd avoid mirrors and felt as though I was a complete and utter failure, which was not made any better by my parents, who pressured me with, how many applications did you send today? Or, you really need to get this job so you can start saving to move out. This might sound mean, but they didn't mean it in a bad way. Since I'd expressed the need to get my own flat for the past few years, not to mention my relationship with my parents at the time, was very strained, since my depression made me very irritable and angry. So I can't really blame them for pushing me to get out of the house. This continued for around a half a year, until I finally got a job in a hypermarket about 8 miles away from the place I lived in. Life really picked up from there, and I started to take care of myself once again. The people I worked with were very, very nice people, and I had no issues with anyone, though they were very normal, so I'd get invited to get togethers or to have a, a pint after work, etc. I always made an excuse why I couldn't go, and would play MMOs or something instead at home. This might sound sad, but I enjoyed myself more like that. Fast forward a year of working, and I was accepted into my number one choice university, and due to this, I cut my work hours to half, so I was only at work for like two to three nights a week. This particular hypermarket chain I worked at had a yearly festival week gimmick to boost sales, and this year, we were handed scratch cards to sell during the cashing out process. Apparently, the chain had a contest within every location, and the winning hypermarket would be given a $1,000 cash prize for employee refreshment purposes. Booze. Our hypermarket decided we'd take everyone out for a night drinking in a hotel and resort area. Connected to the shopping mall, our workplace was with the money. No surprise there. And since I had grown close with many of the other cashiers, I was motivated to win, even if I usually didn't enjoy going out. Everyone in the department was so excited for it, it was kind of infectious, I guess. Long story short, we won the competition and went drinking and at a karaoke bar. Our, our, our boss was so pleased with how well we did and how motivated we were, he even opened us a tab in the first bar we went to, so I had quite a bit to drink. When the first bar closed down, we went to continue into a nearby nightclub. I hardly remember anything else other than I drank like a sailor and sang karaoke horribly. We stayed until closing time, and I made my way to a train station to catch the last train home on my way. I was stopped by a man with a thick accent, who asked if he could walk me home. I laughed and just said that no worries, I was literally a few steps away, and motioned towards the station. He then apologized, and said he thought I lived in a student building nearby and went on his way. I thought that was quite an endearing way to ask someone out, and thought nothing more of it. Another year passes by. 
and I'm living alone in a student block not far away from my parents' home. The area I moved to was very poor, since it consisted only of students, so in a weird way, I actually felt very safe living there. The walls were thin as paper, so everyone would hear if anything happened to me, or if anyone tried to break into my home, etc. Granted, I got an email from the company that funded the cheap student blocks that the bike seller in your address was broken into, but I never kept anything in there, so it didn't really phase me. Sometimes I even forget my keys on the lock in the front door and wake up in the morning to a neighbor ring my doorbell and handing me the keys with a joking, nothing to steal, huh? There was also a very convenient bus that stopped right outside my door that I could take for both school and work, though. I needed another bus to get all the way back to work. One Saturday, after a nine-hour shift at work, looking and feeling like a total zombie, I was making my way to the bus stop through an underpass late at night when I heard someone call out to me through my earphones. I always stopped if I heard someone call out when I was near work since it usually was a colleague offering a lift or a regular customer wanting to crack a joke or one of the guys from the GameStop upstairs wanted to talk about Skyrim or something like that. I was basically friends with nearly every employee in the mall, so someone stopping me late at night in a sketchy parking lot or underpass was very common. I didn't recognize the men, but then again, I handled around 600 customers every day, so I hardly ever did. I also was conditioned to flash a bright smile through years of customer service whenever I met someone's eyes, even outside of work. I'm sure the ones who've worked in customer service jobs for a long time can relate to this. The man spoke hurriedly in a thick accents about how he was in love with me and how he has been watching me. It was very hard to make sense of anything he was saying. It was a stream of consciousness kind of thing how he spoke. What I did make out was that he had seen me in a bar, which he named, and ever since he had been watching me, I never before found the courage to talk to me before now. I was unsettled by the choice of words, but I chuckled. But I chucked it to him not being a native speaker. I listened to him while I nervously eyed the underpass, feeling glad that there were a few people walking in through his whole spiel. After he quieted down, I just awkwardly said, Okay, thanks, but I need to go or I'll miss my bus, and turned to continue on. When he grabbed me and pushed me back towards the walls of the underpass, I was around 30 centimeters taller than him, but he had a lot of mass over me, since the most sports I'd ever done was acrobatics and ballet, and I'd quit that even years ago. I considered punching him or screaming, but I felt it better not to escalate the whole entire situation. So I sternly told him to let me go and that I need to get to the station. He pleaded for me to give him a chance and said he wouldn't let me go before I did. I was racking my brain about the safest way out of the situation, so I tentatively told him, What if I save your number and see if I'll call ya? I'd used this on another persistent suitor before, and it just worked fine. Now I wish I'd never uttered those words. The man's face lit up, and he started to spell out his name, as he was someone from the Middle East. When I pulled up my phone and hammered his name and number into my phone, sighing a relief, I was almost safely back at my home, and suddenly he grabbed my hand and tore my phone from my hands. At this point, I angrily screamed, what the fuck are you doing? Give it back! But to my horror, everyone had moved on from the underpass, and I was alone with this creeper. And he ignored me, struggling and screaming completely, and calmly just said his own phone number from it, before handing it back to me, as if what he did was just completely normal. I stared at him, terrified and dumbfounded. He then hugged me tight, caught the feel, and tried kissing me. I hurriedly blocked his mouth with my hands and forcibly pushed him away. I didn't say anything more and just ran out of the underpass, and he didn't try to stop me. When I was safely at home, I blocked his number first and then deleted it, thanking any deity possible that when I moved out and got my new phone, my father had insisted on an unlisted one, so he couldn't just find my address out by Google. I asked my manager not give me the Saturday night shift for a while and explain my problem to her. I also asked if he could be banned from the store or something, but she told me she couldn't do anything before I filed a restraining order. Obviously, I had no idea what the man's name or number was anymore. Not to mention getting a restraining order on him, based on what I had as evidence, was very unlikely. A few weeks went by, and he showed up when I was at work without fail, as if he knew my shift. Even though I had a different shift every week, he'd just stare at me from outside the shop, or buy a single lollipop or something else cheap multiple times a day, paying with cash, so I could extend my hand to him, which he always took and held for, as long as there were no other customers there. The horrible thing about this was, it was not unusual to get a creeper customer every so often. Every now and then, you get them if you work as a cashier, mentally ill or socially inept desperate people mistake customer service as genuine interest painfully often, and if you hardly pay attention to it, then the other customers, since nearly always it's a short-term thing and kind of harmless, 
Basically, this man could have been stalking me for God knows how long, and I just hadn't noticed. The thought that I only noticed this now, now that I had that earlier encounter with him, was enough for me to lose sleep over and get a reoccurring sleep paralysis nightmare of someone entering my room and breathing heavily in my ear as a result. This went on, and it was now a few days until my four weeks of paid and four weeks of unpaid summer vacation I had requested and given. The thought of not having to go to work and face the man every day was enough to perk me up, to be honest, so I threw myself into an extracurricular school project. One day, I had stayed at school working on a 2D rig for said project until school was closing, and the janitor ushered me out of the classroom. I had a little while before my bus was due to arrive at the stop, so I decided to catch some fresh air after working nearly 12 hours on the computer and walked to a nearby station. That was the end of the line. The bus was already well, the bus was already waiting, so I rushed in, and after I paid the fee and faced the back of the bus, my stomach turned. There he was, with three guys. The guy with a thick accent, my stalker. We were the only passengers. I thought about getting off of the bus, but the next one wouldn't be an hour or so. Against all common sense, I decided to stay on. I sat at the very front of the bus, hoping that he wouldn't notice me, but as soon as the bus left the station, he moved to sit next to me, and his friends moved to sit behind me, as if he knew this was the line I usually took, and just waited so I couldn't exit the bus. I was ready to throw up. I turned my music so loud in my ears it hurt. I ignored every tap and shoulder grab. I clutched my laptop back on my lap, ready to sacrifice my computer and smack him in the face with it if he tried to do anything else. Then the realization hit me. The line stopped literally on the front door of my building. My name was plastered on the front door of my building. He would know where I lived. I felt as if I could burst into a howling cry any minute now. My thoughts were going a mile a minute, considering everything that could happen to me if I didn't have a way to get out of this situation. I knew there was a longer stop coming up later, so I decided to try to make my break there. When the stop rolled around, heart pounding, I said, music still breaking my eardrums. Sorry, I need to get off here. I made my way to the mid doors, all four men following me, speaking fast in Hebrew. When the doors opened, I step out and walk a while, before suddenly turning back and running like I was possessed back into the bus and yelling at the driver, Drive, just go, please, please, please. The driver looked taken aback, looked at the men who were running towards the bus, and back on my face, twisted into loud sobs, and how I was shaking. And he decided I was serious, closed the door, and sped off. He stopped the bus at a garage a few miles away, asked if he could do anything, called the cops or something. I just kept sobbing and recanted my first encounter to him when something in my head clicked. The bar. He had specifically named it. It was the nightclub we went to continue our drinking over a year ago, when we won the contest. I never before or after had visited that nightclub. He said he saw me there. He had been tailing me over a year. That night, he was the one who offered to walk me home. That's why he showed up at my work without fail whenever I was working. I sobbed, howled like a damn tortured cat at that, and the driver told me to go, go lie down in the back and that he would drive me home, and I told him it was the last stop. The driver dropped me off safely home before he continued his round, risking his job for my safety. I can't thank him enough, and I don't even know his name. After the second incident, I called him work sick until my vacation and cut off my hair and dyed it black. I also spent the vacation biking around my town during the daytime. Staying out from the town, my work and school was the whole two months. I occasionally still sometimes had those sleep paralysis nightmares, but I never saw him again. A small part of me thinks it's because he doesn't want me to. One thing is for sure though, I never left my keys in my lock again, so the man with a thick accent, let's not meet.